there's nothing reassuring about the stillness that pervades this valley. It's a stronghold of Boko Haram on the border between Cameroon and Nigeria. 500 meters ahead lies the first Nigerian village in the sights of the Cameroonian army. Paula. Under the command of Captain Kinge, soldiers are on the lookout for any movement along this porous border. That's the border and our outpost. Here we're still in Cameroon, but as soon as we cross that marker, we're in Nigeria. On the Cameroon side, on a hilltop, a military outpost has recently been set up. Who's in charge here? Me, sir. Situation. Any movement from Nigerian forces coming from Madagalani over there? Sporadic fire only now and then. OK. Fighting is rare in this area, but now there's a new, more dangerous threat, suicide bombers. All around us are small villages which regularly come under attack by Boko Haram. We have a mission to prevent them from crossing. It's no secret, they've changed tactics. I mean, they've decided to move on to the suicide bombing phase of their attacks. Their method is simple successfully infiltrate local populations and then blow themselves up. Here in the far north of Cameroon, there have been around 30 suicide attacks by Boko Haram in the last 12 months. A daily threat, but also an invisible one. We set off again, heading for the village of Kuyape, the scene of a recent attack. With us are 15 armed guards. On arrival, we're met by the village chief, still in shock after a suicide attack severely damaged this mosque. In this man's video footage, the mosque was filmed after the attack by the first military personnel to arrive on the scene. Those are traces from the explosion. And over there were three dead bodies. And on the other side were also more corpses. The suicide bomber stood here, his leg was there, the other leg was there. The suicide bomber slipped and as soon as he was inside, he detonated his bomb. His head was found on the other side. When a bomber explodes, the head flies the farthest. On the cell phone of one villager, a photo of the bomber's head. He was barely 14 years old an adolescent radicalized by the jihadists, just like these two young girls, intercepted before they could detonate their explosive devices, grenades made from cluster bombs. It's the favored weapon of the suicide bombers, who are now hounded by Cameroonian special forces. The Rapid Response Brigade has an urgent mission, to hunt down and stop the wave of suicide bombings. This morning is the start of an operation prepared over the last two weeks. How many men have you already put in the field? 240? OK. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Nlate is leading the operation against the suicide bombers, a counter-offensive which will take place on Nigerian soil on the other side of the border. The plan is a ground attack targeting a jihadist camp spotted by Cameroonian intelligence services. We are going to try and find a base near our borders, where the suicide bombers are coming from. We'll try to take down its numerous networks, its training sites, and stop the implementation of Boko Haram's suicide bomber strategy. Targeting the suicide bombers inside Nigeria is risky. To prepare for the assault, the men gather in Kolofata, the base camp for this operation near the Nigerian border. All the task force under my command, at ease. In front of the lieutenant colonel, 350 soldiers ready to go to war. Good afternoon, gentlemen. And a very good afternoon it will be. We are now in the final phase of our preparations. Complete operational details will be given to you by each of your section commanders. 
Before crossing the border, in the officer's mess, the final details are outlined. We're giving you extra equipment because you have to prepare for the system to break down. If you're cut off, that's not good. The risk of a suicide bombing is on everyone's mind. During briefings, we talk not only about explosive devices, but also booby-trapped doors, rooms, car bombs, and a suicide bomber who might jump into the midst of our troops. You can enter a village and a young boy or a young girl, apparently from the village, could start moving towards the unit. In short, we try and inform the men about this particular threat and the risks it poses to them. Briefings end and the final countdown begins. Operations commence in 24 hours' time. OK, we're off, my son. About 30 kilometres away, Father Gregoire is the last white priest in this region. Threatened by the Nigerian jihadists, a man of God escorted wherever he goes by armed guards. We'll arrive at the crossroads with the old track. We'll cross and then be on the old trail. The French priest knows all the local routes. He's lived here for 22 years. When under escort, even at Kolofata, I'm often at the front, so there's nothing to worry about. OK, we're off. We've lost enough time already. Despite the suicide attacks, leaving his flock behind at Tokombere village is out of the question. We'll be passing in front of the Tokombere mosque. For some time now, there's been a heavy guard at the mosque when prayers are taking place with all the attacks these last few days. The number of Muslim victims is much bigger than Christian casualties. Of course, some Christians have been killed, but most of them not because of their specific religion, just because they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Father Gregoire has put himself on the line to confront fear and resist the terror of Boko Haram. He has 24-7 protection, even when he travels deep into the desert to celebrate mass with Christians. Today, the terrorist threat is part of life across virtually the entire world. So one can't stop living simply because of it, or else you need to go live on the moon or go hide in a bubble or in some other place. It just makes no sense. One has to find one's place and then stay there. Life goes on. There are still plenty of Christians who are out here and who want to stay in this area where they are and live in peace with their neighbours or with Muslim communities. After an hour on the road, we enter a backwater settlement, the home of a small Christian community. Hello, Thomas. Welcome. Thank you. Here's the bag for Mars. A special mass this Sunday, a day to celebrate three new baptisms. And here are the stars of the day, Pascal and where's Pascaline? Over there. Hello, Lynette, are you well? Yes? Yes. Coming here to celebrate life despite the danger is one way of defying Boko Haram. Myself, I'm not afraid of dying. I may be afraid to die foolishly, as I often say. What would bother me would be to die without my life having a meaning. Whether I try and avoid death or not, death will always eventually find me. So if it finds me hiding behind a tree, I'd be ashamed. But if it finds me going about my ministry, well then, bring it on. I'm ready. The war forms the backdrop to every service performed by Father Gregoire. He's a priest on a mission for peace, trying to stave off a religious war between Christians and Muslims. We have in our midst soldiers who help us and who protect us, trying to prevent an all-out war, and we're thankful to them and we pray for them. Our battle, our work, is to give up our life, if need be, to announce the good will. Whether you're a Muslim, a Catholic, a Protestant, an Adventist, no matter what you are, you are my brother. 
If you're Boko Haram, you're still a brother. You're my brother who does dumb stuff, but you are still my brother. Because the way out from violence, the way out from war, is through brotherhood. Pascaline, I baptize you. Careful, it's cold. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A moment of joy as well as of solace in these days of war. We'll be integrating your unit with nine assets. We return with Lieutenant Colonel Nlate to the border. Before the attack on the camp of the Nigerian suicide bombers, a last stop to meet one of his officers in the field. Captain Njanko reporting, sir. What's your status? All is well, Colonel. An officer responsible for gathering intelligence in this border sector from groups of informants like this one. Hundreds of these village militias have been created in the last few months. Have the group leader step forward and the others line up behind him. Villagers like these are the main victims of the suicide bombers. Now they've been turned into lookouts for the army. Armed only with rudimentary weapons, their job is to spot the suicide bombers. We have sticks to fight Boko Haram, and over here we have machetes to fight them with too. You see, we never sleep, and we're always ready, every day, every night, we're at our posts. Just as a reminder, there is the slightest incident while you're on night watch, don't forget. You have phones, so use them. In these times of suicide attacks, it's particularly difficult for us to meet with local populations. But they're a precious asset, enabling us to maintain effective surveillance. They are our eyes, even though they'll never be fighters. A few hours later, at sunset, the special forces launched their assault. For security reasons, we were not allowed to follow them into Nigeria. The only images of the operation are photos taken in the jihadist camp. Weapons, cash, ammunition and a flag. According to this internal report from the special unit, 17 potential suicide bombers were killed during the raid. The wave of suicide attacks has already claimed more than 200 lives in Cameroon. Fought in the mists of the far north, it's a war against an unprecedented threat, of which the outcome is far from certain. Our reporter, Patrick Fondio, is here in the studio. Patrick, thank you.